Today's topic is cavitation. In the jet boating world, cavitation refers to pump overspin caused by air or vapor inside the pump. There's basically three ways to get air or vapor inside the pump. The first and most obvious way is if the back of your boat is out of the water, then obviously air is getting inside the pump. Uh, the second way is if you're in frothy water that's full of bubbles, then those bubbles are getting inside the pump. And the third and least obvious way to cavitate is if you're sitting in still water and you punch the gas really hard, then your pump will cavitate. And this can be a little bit mysterious and is the focus of today's talk. So the first thing to think about is the boiling temperature of water. Everyone knows that water boils at 212 degrees Fahrenheit when you're at sea level. And when you go up in elevation to one mile, then the boiling temperature is 202 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is because the pressure has decreased as you've gone up that one mile. And if you continue to climb up to the, say, the top of Mount Everest at 29,000 feet, then the boiling temperature is 162 degrees Fahrenheit, just because the pressure has decreased. And if you continue to climb even farther, let's say you found a mountain that was 60,000 feet high, then your reward when you get to the top of that mountain is that you would start to boil because the boiling temperature is only 98 degrees. The next thing to think about is potential energy. Suppose you're standing on top of a building, then your potential energy relative to the ground is your mass times the gravitational constant times your height above the ground. Now suppose you jump off the building, then your potential energy decreases as H decreases, and what you lose in potential energy, uh, you gain in kinetic energy, which is defined as one-half mass times velocity squared. When your potential energy has gone to zero, then H is zero and you hit the ground. Uh, this relationship, of course, assumes that there is no wind friction. If there is significant wind friction, then part of your potential energy is lost to just beating the air and so you won't gain as much kinetic energy as your initial height would imply. The concept of potential energy is also present in fluid flow. Fluid tends to flow from high pressure to low pressure, just like you tend to fall from high elevation to low elevation. As you fall from a high elevation to a low elevation, you lose potential energy and gain kinetic energy. The same type of thing happens as fluid flow accelerates down a pipe. It gains kinetic energy and loses potential energy, which is its pressure. This implies that the pressure decreases simply because the fluid has sped up and accelerated down the pipe. And the pressure decrease is defined as one half times the density times the velocity squared. And you'll notice that this is basically identical to the form for your kinetic energy increase as you fall off of a building. In a jet boat, the water below the boat is sucked into the pump and it accelerates into the pump to a relatively high velocity before it even reaches the impeller. This implies that the pressure decreases simply because the water is moving faster. This raises the question, how much has the pressure decreased? Has it dropped to the boiling point of the water? If so, it will begin to boil and the boiling creates bubbles that are, can be thought of as cavities, and this is why the process is referred to as cavitation. So this raises the next question, which is how much does the pressure actually decrease as the water approaches your impeller? And unfortunately, to answer that question, we have to use some equations. So recall from high school physics, or maybe you don't recall, that energy equals one-half mv squared, and power equals one half m dot v squared, where m dot is the mass flow rate, and you can get the mass flow rate from the density times the velocity times the flow area. And power is one half density times the area at the nozzle times the velocity cubed at the nozzle. And then we can get the area at the nozzle by pi d squared over four, uh, where uh, this D is the capital D, which refers to the diameter of the nozzle, which in this case would be 109 millimeters for your Hamilton 212. Then if we rearrange this equation, we can get an equation for velocity, 
and then it's 8 times the power over the density times pi times the diameter squared, all taken to the 1 third power, also known as the cubed root. So there you have it. You can figure out what the velocity is coming out the nozzle based on this equation. Then based on the concept that velocity times flow area is constant, we can use the area ratio between the nozzle and the inside of the pump to get the velocity inside the pump, which will be a, a bit lower than the velocity at the nozzle. So then using a bunch of conversion factors to turn horsepower and diameters and millimeters and stuff into the correct units, we can actually end up with some uh, very interesting results. In this figure, the bottom axis is horsepower to the water. Uh, this is different from the horsepower of your engine, which has to be just a little bit higher. And due to engine inefficiency, then the water only receives a fraction of the horsepower that your engine generates. And on the left axis uh, is velocity. And this axis applies to the black line, which is the velocity at the nozzle, and the red line, which is the velocity at the inlet just upstream from your uh, impeller inside of your jet pump. So with zero horsepower, of course, the velocity is zero. And as the horsepower increases, then so does the velocity. And when you're up to 400 horsepower to the water, which uh, might be 500 engine horsepower, then the nozzle velocity is 90 miles an hour. And the velocity inside the pump is about, uh, let's say, 25 miles an hour. So what does this mean for pressure inside the pump? And that's related by the gray line. Uh, which references the right axis, which is the pressure. And at zero horsepower, the pressure begins at 14.7 PSI, which is the atmospheric pressure at sea level. And then as the horsepower increases and the velocity increases, the pressure decreases. So by the time you're at 400 horsepower, then the pressure in inside the pump is, let's say, about uh, six and a half PSI. And if you were to keep increasing the horsepower to the water, and by the time you get up to about 950 horsepower, then the pressure has uh, basically gone to zero, and you're definitely boiling inside the pump before the water even gets to the impeller. So at 6.5 PSI, is the water anywhere near boiling? And so here we can uh, go to this boiling curve, and on the curve you can see a bunch of points at 14.7 PSI, the boiling temperature is 212. Then uh, the next point over is at uh, one mile of elevation, and the pressure is down to about 12, and the boiling point is at 202. And then if you go over farther, then this point is uh, top of Mount Everest, where the pressure is, say, 4.5 PSI, and the boiling point is you know, 160 or something. And then by the time you get down to 1 PSI, that's where you would begin to boil. But for 400 horsepower to the water, the pressure is, say, 6.5 PSI. So that means, uh, yes, the water would boil inside the pump if the temperature was around 170 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, you know, and typically you're not boating on that hot of water. It'll be more like 50 and so the, the, the pressure would have to be you know, well below 1 PSI before you'd be boiling. So no, you're not going to boil inside of the pump uh, given typical horsepower in a jet boat application. So now you're probably wondering, well, if uh, it's not boiling inside of the pump, then why do I care about all this crap anyway? Well, when the water finally reaches the impeller, the pressure will decrease even further on the low pressure side of the impeller. And if this pressure decrease is sufficient to get it to the boiling point, then it will flash into water vapor and will cavitate. Now getting back to this other plot, you'll notice that at 400 horsepower, the velocity inside the pump is about 25 miles an hour. Uh, and, and, and that causes the pressure decrease. So if you can take your time getting up to speed and don't just jam on the 400 horsepower in, a, in an instant, and if you can get the boat speed up to 25 miles an hour, then that speed will completely offset the decrease in pressure that occurs inside the pump and keep the impeller farther from the boiling point. 
So this explains why you can cavitate when you're sitting in nice calm water. Basically the water rushes into the pump and the pressure decreases and when the water reaches the impeller the pressure decreases even further possibly to the boiling point. Appropriate impeller design can minimize this boiling and if it's limited to just the front edge of the impeller then you may not notice it at all or you may experience it as what is referred to as a flare which is just a partial cavitation. And now I've spent enough time on this, so this is the end.